Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can I welcome you to the Royal Society? It's my great pleasure this evening to introduce our uh, distinguished speaker, Professor Sir Peter Crane, who's going to be talking about the origins of flowers. Before I give a very brief introduction to Peter, can I just uh, remind people that this uh, talk is going to be webcast live, and not only must we have our mobile phones off, but we must have, the, we must have them completely off, not just on uh, silent, otherwise it does terrible things to the web broadcast. So th there are three brief things I want to tell you about Peter before he starts his talk. First, Peter is one of our most distinguished botanical scientists. Darwin famously said, and you'll hear more about this from Peter, that the origin of flowers is an abominable mystery. And although that mystery isn't completely solved, we are a long way down compared with Darwin's day. And this is through a combination of molecular studies, morphological studies, and paleont... Paleo I can't even say it. Fossil studies. <laughs> And Peter has been one of the leaders, especially in the fossils and the morphological side. He's a member of the Royal so fellow of the Royal Society, foreign member of the National Academy, and many other academies around the world. Second thing I'd like to tell you about Peter is that he is a hugely distinguished and excellent science leader. Peter first um, led a major organization in the States, the famous Field Museum in Chicago. And from there, he moved to Kew Gardens, where he was director for seven years, stepping down two years ago. And Kew has been enormously fortunate to have a series of direct directors, Ian Prance, then Peter, and Steve Hopper now, who really made Kew one, a world-class biodiversity inst institution. Peter returned to Chicago, as I said, two years ago, but has recently announced that he's moving again and is going to go to Yale to become dean of the School of Forestry and Environmental uh, Studies. The last thing I'd like to tell you about Peter is a more personal thing, in that Peter is a handy man to have in the jungle. I, I was hugely fortunate to spend a week with Peter in the uh, forests of Malaysian Borneo about two years ago, in fact, looking at a Royal Society program out there. And, and Peter, as well as being a fabulous scientist, is a wonderful naturalist. I, I learned a huge amount, especially about some of the less showy flowers and the ferns and the mosses and things. And Peter is also immensely resourceful. We'd planned to go to this wonderful lost world plateau, the Maliao Basin, and it looked like we weren't going to be able to get there because meetings kept multiplying and things. And we were about to abandon it when uh, Sir Peter Crane, the director of Kew, managed to rustle up a helicopter. <laughs> and so we rushed out of the meeting, peeling off suits and getting into our field gear, and got out there in, and also managing to avoid a 2,000-feet climb through hot, sticky... Uh, Weather. So I've always thought, Peter, that if you get bored of science, that there's a career ahead of you as I'm a botanical celebrity, get me into there. Or something. <laughs> so without more ado, can I ask you to come and give the talk on the origins of flowers? Charles, thanks very much indeed. It's a very great pleasure to be here. And um, uh, this evening I want to talk about... Um, the origins of flowers, but I want to preface my remarks uh, first with um, some acknowledgements. And um, my two long-term collaborators, uh, Elsa Marie Fries and Kai Pedersen, are here in the audience, and much of the work that you'll see this evening uh, was work that we've done together over the last uh, 25 or 30 years uh, uh, even, so uh, they deserve a huge amount of the credit for what progress we've made in some of the areas uh, that I'll talk about. This question of uh, really where flowers uh, come from uh, in an evolutionary sense is obviously uh, an important and fascinating one, and it's tied up with the origin of the group that bears these wonderful flowers. This is the American lotus photographed on the Mississippi um, last summer. But it was a, this was a topic that uh, uh, Darwin was uh, very interested in, and as... Uh, uh, Charles has already mentioned this famous uh, quote, the rapid development, as far as we can judge, of all the higher plants within recent geological times is an abominable mystery. It's a mystery to me how this quote has really sort of taken off uh, in the literature because it was just a quote in a letter written to one of my predecessors at Kew, uh, Joseph Hooker. 
But it was, I think, really popularised by the paleobotanist Seward, who, with Darwin's son, published several of his letters, and he drew attention to this quote uh, very early on. And I think it's worth considering what this quote means, because it's been used in many ways by many different people for many different aspects of this general problem. And I think uh, the essential uh, elements uh, of this is, is um, uh, rapid development, higher plants, by which he means flowering plants, within recent geological times. These, I think, are the two key things. So he's, he's worried about the, the speed, and he's worried about the fact that they show up um, rather late. And it's also worth, of course, uh, mentioning Darwin's relationship uh, with Hooker, and indeed his general interest in plants. Several of the books uh, he wrote dealt with specific botanical topics, and at least three of them dealt with uh, particular issues related to the evolution of flowers. And the relationship between Darwin uh, and Hooker was a very close one. Uh, uh, there's a note in the Kew archives uh, that came to Hooker from one of Darwin's children after his death that says, you were his closest friend. So Hooker and Darwin were really very close, and they shared an interest in botanical topics. This is a nice North American uh, prairie. And the scene that I show you is really just to... Um, uh, just to remind you that the world's vegetation is dominated uh, by flowering plants. And uh, if you look at the species numbers, and uh, I should say there's only one number on here that we know for sure, and that's that ginkgo only has one species. <laughs> um, but the point is really to simply to show you that flowering plants with three, 350, 400,000 living species far and away dominate the diversity of plants on land right now. So they show up late in the fossil record. All of these groups have a fossil history that goes back 200 million years or more, whereas angiosperms have a fossil record that goes back about 100 million years, and we'll look at that uh, in more detail uh, in a moment. So that's the, the recent origin piece of the Darwin uh, abominable mystery. And the other piece is that... Um, where this great transition occurs, which is roughly at about 100 million years, you move from fossil floras which are dominated by ferns and cycads and conifers and other seed plants into floras which are dominated by angiosperms. And you can see this uh, in the field. If you're in late Cretaceous deposits, it's all angiosperms. And if you're in early Cretaceous deposits, there's not an angiosperm to be seen. So Darwin was, was interested in the rapidity of this radiation and his interest was piqued even more by the fact that the fossils that were being described in the latter part of the 19th century from places like Greenland and North America and Southern Europe were, to the paleobotanists of the day, very similar to living flowering plants. So it seemed that you went from nothing to a kind of fully formed flora very, very uh, quickly. And this was, this was clearly at the heart of Darwin's uh, worries. So what I'm going to do uh, today is really deal with these uh, five questions. And uh, uh, perhaps the most interesting one of these is number five, and that's the one that you'll hear least about. I'll spend my time uh, on the other uh, four. So let's first consider this question of uh, the abominable mystery and the extent to which it's solved or not. The abominable mystery, I would argue, at least in the sense that Darwin was using that term, in terms of the recency uh, and in terms of the rapidity, is to a large extent uh, solved. And that's because this uh, apparently sudden change during the mid-Cretaceous, looked at now with better stratigraphy, looked at now with better techniques, appears much more gradual. And that work uh, was really... Um, brought to uh, a kind of set of conclusions in the mid-1970s in two books, one by Norman Hughes, The Paleobiology of Angiosperm Origins, and uh, a volume edited by Charlie Beck, The Origin and Early Evolution uh, of Angiosperms. They both came out in 1976. 
And I'll just show you one diagram from the Doyle and uh, Hickey paper. And this is across that uh, early, late Cretaceous boundary. And what it really shows is that uh, down here in the Aptian, uh, in the early Cretaceous, we have uh, a relatively um, sparse uh, diversity of angiosperm leaves, a few angiosperm uh, pollen grains. But by the time we move up, a couple of tens of millions of years, we've got a much greater variety of leaves and a much greater variety uh, of pollen grains. And interestingly, one of the places where you see this gradation the best, at least based on the pollen grains, not based on really anything uh, else, is in a variety of floras from uh, southern, and e southern England. And this diagram shows the phases rec recognized by Norman Hughes through this interval in his book that came out a little later in the 1990s, and then the incoming of different kinds of angiosperm pollen grains through this interval. They come in a nice sequential uh, appearance. So when you look in more detail, they don't come in quite as suddenly as Darwin uh, expected. They come in uh, more gradually, and I think that dilutes part of the uh, abominable mystery. What's interesting, though, is that these very earliest angiosperm uh, pollen grains are all based on a, a very similar plan. And uh, here are two pollen grains uh, viewed with a scanning electron microscope uh, of that age. And they each have a single germinal uh, aperture. We call these things monoculpate pollen grains. A little bit later in the fossil record come other grains with three apertures and a symmetry of uh, pollen grains which is quite different uh, from uh, those early forms. And we now know, based on the wonderful advances that have been made in understanding the phylogenetic relationships among this great group of flowering plants, much of it done by Mark Chase, who's here in the audience, and his colleagues, we now know that the groups of angiosperms fit together like this, and those pollen grains with those three apertures are characteristic of this group, uh, the eudicots. The eudicots account for uh, around 75% of living angiosperm species, and pollen grains of that kind come in relatively late compared to pollen grains of the other kind. So what we have then is exactly what we would have expected uh, in the fossil record from the systematics. There's complete concordance of these two lines of evidence with respect to uh, this one uh, particular feature of the pollen grains, which is a very important one. So eudicots with those pollen grains with the three apertures, about three quarters of living angiosperm species, and I won't dwell on how they get those three apertures, but I'll simply go back to Norman Hughes's diagram. These are different sections, uh, in, uh, some in the north of England, most of them in the south of England. His phase is coming through here, and while we have lots of uh, uh, monoaperturate pollen grains, angiosperm pollen grains at this level, we first get these triaperturate pollen grains, characteristic of uh, eudicots, one grain in these samples that he looked at, one grain in these samples. And in other parts of the world, those pollen grains appear at about that same uh, level. This is one of the pollen grains that Norman Hughes figured uh, from his book. And these are very important because they give us a, one of our most robust tie points for the origin of a major clade of uh, flowering plants. So just to sort of roughly summarize what we see through the early uh, Cretaceous. By the time we get down to the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary at about 144 million years, we have no evidence of angiosperms. At about 135 million years, we see the first incoming of these monoculpate pollen grains with a particular kind of pollen wall uh, diagnostic of flowering plants. And then a little later, we see the incoming of this triaperturate pollen of presumed eudicots. So to some extent, Part of that abominable mystery, the part that deals with the rapidity, is solved. We can see a stepwise incoming of flowering plants into the fossil record, and the order of appearance corresponds well to the order of appearance that would be predicted from our studies of living plants uh, alone. Let's move on to the second issue of, of uh, what is a flower. And um, uh, I'll start with a, a wonderful illustration from the time of uh, Darwin. This is 
uh, Victoria Amazonica. This is uh, uh, Fitch strawing for um, a Joseph Hooker's father, actually, when this plant flowered uh, in uh, the UK for the first time uh, in cultivation. It's a water lily, a giant uh, water lily. We have the carpels with the ovules inside that develop into the seeds. Uh, we have the stamens in this, time, in this flower around the edge of a cup, and then we have a, a variety of um, petal-like perianth members around the outside, and this is the common pattern that we see uh, in the water lily uh, family. But we also see great variation in this uh, water lily family, and uh, the reason that I'm focusing on this family is that it's one of the very earliest lineages to branch from the main line of flowering plant uh, evolution. So looking at what that lineage looks like uh, today is a very important framework for interpreting uh, some of the uh, early Cretaceous uh, fossils. So this is a, another genus, and this has uh, much smaller, more simple uh, flowers. And indeed, this one is uh, uh, wind-pollinated rather than uh, insect-pollinated. And then, just recently, incredibly, uh, we've had the discovery of this remarkable uh, plant, um, uh, much of the original wo work done by Paula Rodol from Kew, who's here in the audience, the discovery of this thing, which for a long time we thought might be related to grasses, we now find that it's related uh, to this water lily uh, family. And over the last couple of days, we've had a, a, a wonderful symposium here on uh, floral biology and floral evolution, and one of the things that uh, Paula pointed out uh, in her paper is how difficult it is, actually, to define the flower in these complex reproductive units uh, here. So it's not always straightforward uh, to define a flower. And, and um, we see this in, in uh, other groups that I'll allude to uh, a little later. This is the molecular phylogenetics um, showing where this curious plant Tritheria fits in. It fits in as the sister group to all others in the water lily clade and the only branch that appears below it down here at the base of the angiosperms is a thing called Amborella, a single species that lives uh, in New Caledonia. More diagnostic or more straightforward than the flower itself are the components that go to build up uh, an angiosperm flower. And there, I really want to highlight these, these three uh, components because these are the things that we should be trying to explain the origin of uh, in the fossil record if we're interested in the origin of flowers and the origin of flowering plants. The pollen-producing organs of flowering plants, the stamens, are very characteristic structures. I think for a long time we overlooked just how distinctive they were, but they're quite unlike the pollen-producing structures of any other seed plant uh, that we know. They have two pairs of pollen sacs. And then the feature that we've always focused on is the origin of the carpel itself. This is a structure that encloses the ovule and ultimately matures into the fruit. And then there's the ovule uh, itself, because this ovule has two surrounding coverings, two uh, integuments. So, as we'll see in a moment, the female parts of a flower, a typical angiosperm, uh, flower is like a sort of matryoshka doll with one thing inside the other. We've got um, the megasporangium uh, at the center, surrounded by a new cellus, surrounded by one layer, surrounded by another layer, both integuments, and then surrounded by uh, the carpal. So if we go to another very simple flower at the base of uh, flowering plants, you can see this uh, Curious angiosperm stamen, you're only seeing one side of it here, but this is one of the theci in which there are two uh, pollen sacs. There would be two more on the other, on the other side. Here, there are no uh, petal-like perianth parts, just a little bract. Here's the uh, 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 carpal, and inside uh, would be uh, the ovule. This beautiful picture is by Peter Endress, who's in the audience here. It's a genus called Sarcandra. Uh, in the chloranthaceae. So, just to remind you again, a cross-section through that stamen then would look something uh, like this, with these two pairs of pollen sacs and the 
ovule inside the carpal would have these uh, two uh, uh, layers around the, uh, uh, around the new, what we call the new cellus. So what were the earliest flowers like? Well, this is a paleobotanical question. And here I think we've made uh, quite a bit of progress over the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, flowers are not the kind of thing that one would ordinarily expect to find uh, in the fossil record. It's been known for a long time that flowers can be beautifully preserved uh, in amber, and there are several important localities, the Baltic amber, uh, for example, from around 40 million years ago, and the Dominican amber uh, from somewhat uh, a younger time. Um, but in the 1970s, um, David Dilcher and his colleagues, and I was a postdoc in Dilcher's lab uh, back in the early 80s, started to work on fossil flowers from uh, Eocene uh, beds uh, down in Kentucky and Tennessee. And this is a specimen that I collected years ago on a field trip. And this is actually a, a, a mimosoid uh, legume that uh, was described by Dilcher and his colleagues. And these little things here are the, are the anthers of the stamens with these long filaments. And it's clearly related to modern legumes. So the approach to kind of get more fossil flowers was initially to collect them in the same way that you would collect other fossils, to split rocks basically like a convict and open up uh, the slabs and hope that you could find a, uh, a fossil flower. It's tough going. You have to split a lot of rocks. But David Dilcher was very successful in finding some material from the uh, mid-Cretaceous. And this is some material now that's not 50 million years old, as that legume was that I just... Uh, showed you this is about 95 million years old from uh, the Dakota Formation uh, of Kansas. And I won't go into the detail, but simply there's an axis here. It's got these uh, little pods on, and each of these pods has, a, has seeds inside. Here are a couple of the seeds macerated out. And I say I won't go into the detail uh, of it, but all I can say is that I think it's very possible to re reconstruct very convincingly uh, from this uh, flower, this little flowering shoot. We know the leaves, we have the stipules, uh, we have various kinds of uh, tepals, we have the scars of the stamens, and we have the carpels as they develop uh, into fruits. And this is clearly related to uh, the modern uh, family Magnoliaceae, and you might get a, as you know, your woody plants might get a hint of tulip tree leaves uh, from these uh, remarkable Liriophyllum leaves. And that approach was quite successful. There are a few rather important fossils that uh, were described in this way. Uh, this is just one of them that we called Archaeanthus. But the real breakthrough in studying these uh, early Cretaceous flowers and pushing the fossil record back still further um, came at around about the same time uh, in the early 1980s uh, through a new approach. And that was basically taking the uh, approaches that several of us had used and had been used for many years in studying Cenozoic fossil floras, which was to break down the sediment and sieve out uh, the plant fossils. And Elsa Marie applied this technique to sediments that look a bit like this from uh, southern Sweden of about 80 million years before present. And to her and everyone else's astonishment and delight, out came uh, literally uh, hundreds or even thousands of beautiful uh, fossil flowers. These fossil flowers are preserved uh, in various ways, but a very common way is that they're preserved as charcoal. And charcoal is a, an extremely, uh, uh, gives you extremely fine uh, preservation, some shrinkage, but uh, combustion in the absence of oxygen retains the structures beautifully. They're very fragile, but they're beautifully uh, preserved. So this material, this kind of material, has been, become the kind of focus of the paleobotanical, much paleobotanical work uh, in this area. And this is another slide from Elsa Marie, and uh, this is actually very early, early Cretaceous material. Um, and it shows that, that often the material is pretty tiny. And a general feature of these uh, early flowers is that they're really small, not as, quite as small as this, but on the order of a millimeter or two. So they're very small. And since then... Those kinds of fossil occurrences have been found in several localities uh, throughout the world, not only in southern Sweden, but also in Kazakhstan and also 
uh, in Japan, and then several new localities in eastern North America. And this is just a selection of some of these uh, flowers from uh, uh, these floras. And what I want you to notice is it's just the size. These are millimeter scale bars. So these are tiny, tiny little flowers. And these, why are these flowers important? They're important uh, for three main reasons. One reason uh, is that because much of the systematics of living flowering plants is based on flowers, if you've got the flowers, you can do more in terms of understanding how those fossils might be related to living plants. Another important uh, reason is that if you've got the flower, you might be able to say a little bit more about the pollination biology than trying to do that uh, just from the pollen grains alone. And then a third and very important reason that these flowers are uh, important is that you can get the pollen grains out of the anthers uh, and you can therefore start to pin down what the parent plants of some of these dispersed pollen grains are. This is a particularly characteristic uh, kind of pollen grain. It's part of a large group that we call the normopolis uh, that are common in the late Cretaceous of eastern North America and uh, western Europe. And one of the early breakthroughs from the study of these flowers, again by Elsa-Marie Fries, was the discovery of these normopolis pollen grains uh, in uh, now a variety of different flowers which we can clearly relate to the modern group of flowering plants that includes the walnuts, the hazels, the birches, and so on. And these were clearly the, the precursors of these, uh, of these very common uh, temperate trees uh, that we know today. So that's really about the, lower, the upper Cretaceous and the kinds of material that, that we can find. And, and I think another very important point that I want to make, and this is just for a flora that we studied from Georgia around about 80 million years uh, before present. We have thousands of specimens. Um, but as is often the case, uh, a relatively small number of taxa account for most of the material. And then you go out on a very, very long curve, and you've often only got one specimen of a particular kind. And that uh, raises some, some issues. When you've got lots of specimens, you can tear them apart and section them and so on. And indeed, uh, some of these specimens were sectioned in a conventional uh, way uh, using uh, thin sectioning, uh, embedding and thin sectioning uh, approaches. But if you've only got one specimen, or if you've only got a few specimens, um, you'd really rather not destroy it. And more recently, uh, Elsa Marie and her colleagues have pioneered the application of um, X-ray uh, synchrotron microtomography, uh, the Swiss light source, just outside of uh, Zurich. And this now allows the... Uh, here's a scanning electron micrograph of a single flower. And this now allows uh, digital cross-sections of the same specimen, longitudinal sections or transverse uh, sections. Um, with my colleagues Pat Herendine and Masamichi Takahashi, we've been using uh, the same technique, essentially, although not with quite as good resolution as at the Swiss light source. Um, this is at the uh, Spring 8 facility in, uh, uh, just outside of Osaka in, in Japan. And I'll just show you quickly a couple of um, preliminary results. So here is a, here's a lovely flower bud from a locality in Georgia. Here are the, the sepals, and these are the twisted petals. And here is a, a section through the, um, uh, the flower down towards the base with a section through the carpels and then the stamens and then the petals and the remains of the, the sepals around the outside. I'll just show you. Here's a section near the top through the petals itself, a little lower down and a little lower down still. And here's a longitudinal section of the same specimen. So we have the opportunity now to kind of capture digitally, in three dimensions, with pretty good resolution, the structure of even rare specimens that we don't particularly want to dissect or otherwise destroy. So to move on rather quickly, with this array of approaches and with the principle established that we could now get fossil flowers from late Cretaceous sediments, we turned our attention to these early Cretaceous sediments, and uh, we had two seasons of field work, one in the Potomac group, going back to this, these classic localities of Doyle and Hickey, 
to look for fossil flowers that might have been producing some of these pollen grains or that might have been attached to some of these leaves. And we also spent a summer field season in Portugal looking at sediments of around the same age. So this is what the kinds of localities look like, uninspiring sand pits. And uh, when you look carefully, occasionally you find um, some muddy layers in amongst the sand. And you can see a little bit of the uh, organic material through here. And then when you sieve that down and break it down in water, you can float out the floral parts. This is a dish full of stamens. And uh, these are the uh, pollen sacs with the pollen still inside them. And you get beautiful details. I won't go in, but here's a little flower. The stamens are the same flower. The pollen grains are the same flower. The carpels that belong to this flower. The stigmatic surface of, the, of those carpels. And then the appropriate pollen grains nestling among the stigmatic papillae on those uh, carpels. And then a reconstruction of the floral structure. And in this case, it's uh, uh, a particular kind of little inflorescence with a terminal female flower and two little lateral male flowers that are very similar to the flowers of modern boxes, the buxaceae. So this kind of material we now have uh, from the early Cretaceous. This particular example is from the Potomac group. Lots of material from the early Cretaceous of eastern North America and from Portugal too. And there are a few other uh, localities that are uh, very important. And these famous beds in China that have been producing the uh, feathered dinosaurs and early birds have also produced uh, some interesting uh, plant material. This is uh, Archifructus, described by uh, David Dilcher in Science several years ago. And uh, here's a reconstruction of Archifructus, probably uh, a water plant, but it adds to the picture that we get from the mesofossil occurrences. And there's another rather important set of localities uh, from uh, Brazil of Albion uh, age, a little younger than the material uh, from China. But the material from China also kind of rounds out our picture of um, what some of these early flowers uh, were like. So back to our little stratigraphic uh, diagram. We now have flowers from around about 120 million years and maybe even perhaps a little bit older in the oldest uh, localities, right around when the first triaperturate pollen comes in. So far, we don't have uh, flowers that go back into this very earliest phase, but many of these dispersed monocolpate pollen grains we do have in reproductive structures from like slightly uh, younger rocks. So um, what kinds of things are there? So we, start, we now have, just to show it in a different way, we now have floral material, the very earliest mesofloras from Portugal of around this uh, age. They co contain some interesting things. It contains a, quite a lot of angiosperms of various kinds, um, but among them are uh, many that we so far can't assign to living groups um, for one reason uh, or another. Often we uh, understand them pretty well, but it's not clear to which living group they should be uh, related. But in a few cases, we can uh, assign them to living groups. And this one is particularly uh, interesting. This is a, a well-known kind, two well-known kinds of dispersed um, pollen grains. And uh, the pollen grains occur inside uh, angiosperm stamens, which are born in these little inflorescences. Uh, and the inflorescences, um, if that's indeed what they, they are, have uh, no associated, so far anyway, no associated uh, bracts or, or petals or perianth parts associated with them. And they're very, very similar, although a lot, lot smaller, than to the um, uh, pollen-producing organs of the uh, uh, modern family Chloranthaceae, and particularly uh, the genus Hediosmum. And we also have Hediosmum-like fruits. So in these, the point is that in these very earliest floras, there are a few things that we can relate to modern groups of uh, flowering plants. And, as I said at the beginning, the results are rather consistent with the molecular evidence on the phylogenetics. Chloranthaceae is indeed one of these lineages that comes off very early from the main line of uh, angiosperm evolution. Other material down there is a little uh, water lily uh, flower, 
with uh, carpels in the center, stamens around the outside, and, and tepals. And uh, I won't go into the details, but we can relate this, I think, now very securely to uh, modern water lilies based on various details uh, of the flower, including uh, now with the new uh, uh, tomography techniques, the ability to look inside that single specimen and see the seeds sitting inside the gynecium. And this is the same specimen in longitudinal view, and you can, again, see the seeds uh, in position. And this helps secure its relationship to um, the nymphiales. So what do we have in the, let's say, by around 95 million years, what groups can we recognize that we can recognize in, in, in living floras? Well, this is the sort of base of the angiosperm tree. We have good representation of, of uh, this uh, nymphialian clade. We heard that we have, um, in this meeting, we reported the presence of monocots, good, reliable monocots from these very early floras for the first time. And those monocots, this is the mon a breakout of the monocot phylogeny, belong to the Araceae, which falls in this very early clade uh, of the monocots. We have good e evidence of chloranthaceae, as I've just mentioned, perhaps piperales, and, and good strong evidence of both of these groups, laurales and magnoliales, by about 95 million years. And the initial diversification of eudicots, this is a breakout of the eudicots, and we have uh, material that's clearly referral to this group and also uh, to this group. So... In general, what we see is very consistent, as I said, with the uh, molecular phylogenetics. So for the last 10 minutes, I'd like to um, deal with this uh, fourth and then very briefly with the fifth uh, question. Of where did flowers come from? And uh, if this is what we mean when we talk about the abominable mystery, it's still abominable. Um, we haven't made much progress uh, at all on this one. Uh, for a moment, about... Uh, 15 years ago, it seemed like we had it cracked, and then it all came apart again. Um, and it remains to be seen how it will get put back uh, together. One of the, re the issues here is that um, uh, we have had increasingly the application of molecular data, not just to relationships within flowering plants, but how flowering plants relate to other groups of seed plants. Unfortunately, there are only four other groups of living seed plants. <coughs> Cycads, ginkgo, conifers, and a peculiar group called the Nitales, a very important group that we'll talk about in a moment. And to cut a long story short, the morphological analyses that have been done point towards a close relationship of angiosperms and Nitales, and the molecular work that's been done, including by many people in this room, points to anything but a close relationship uh, with, between angiosperms and Nitales. <laughs> And this is a particularly tricky uh, problem because uh, we've got a sampling problem, whichever way you look at it. When we deal with living plants, we can get an enormous amount of information, the whole genome if we want, but what's for a potentially rather poor sample of all the seed plants that have ever lived. If we want to include the fossils, we can get a better sample, but then we're restricted to using morphological data. And either way, we're going to be stuck with this missing data. And at the moment, uh, what we've got is two different scenarios emerging, a molecular set of results that point in one direction um, and a morphological set of results that point in another uh, direction. And for the last few minutes, I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the morphological uh, work. Here is a, uh, uh, a fairly recent uh, tree based on morphological data uh, that evaluates not only the relationship of flowering plants to living seed plants, but also their relationship to fossil seed plants. And uh, angiosperms start around here, and their closest relatives are an extinct group called the Benetitales, this strange group, the Nitales, and then on uh, out. And this is the morphological hypothesis that's held sway now for nearly 30 years. What do these plants look like? Well, very interestingly, and back to our main topic, uh, the Benetitales have flower-like reproductive structures, which is, I think, uh, pretty fascinating. And how they uh, 
exactly work and what they're exactly like is, is um, something that we're, that we're still uh, working on. But this is a beautiful classic specimen from the Stockholm Museum uh, collections uh, showing these gorgeous uh, sort of perianth-like structures. But inside are some pollen-producing organs. And uh, it's not entirely clear what they are from a morphological standpoint. And some of these uh, Benetitales, here's another one, um, from the Middle Jurassic of Yorkshire, um, appear to have been bisexual, producing seeds in the centre, and then uh, pollen grains around the outside, and then some kind of uh, perianth around the outside of that. And then in Nitales, uh, there's a hint of flower-like reproductive structures uh, in the genus Welwitchia, with an aborted ovule in the centre, surrounded by um, pollen-producing organs, surrounded instead by some bracts. The problem, though, is that we really don't know how to compare these things. We don't really know what these different structures represent, how these pollen-producing structures should be compared to these pollen-producing structures, how these ovules should be compared to these ovules, and how they should be compared to the structures seen in other seed plants and in flowering plants. It's worth going back to uh, our thinking about the components of the angiosperm uh, flower. And I'll just say a little bit about um, this issue, the ovule with two surrounding uh, coverings. I have to do it very, very quickly, and then I'll maybe touch on those. Okay, if we take a, if we take a wheat grain, uh, for, for example, I mentioned we've got one structure inside uh, another. We start with a modified megaspore, which is inside the new cellus, surrounded by an inner integument, an outer integument enclosed uh, within a carpal. So we've got a number of layers, and figuring out how these layers should be compared to the layers that we see uh, in uh, other seed plants is really uh, the crux of one of these problems. Accounting for these layers is really the story of the origin of seed plants, which took place 350 million years uh, ago. Accounting for these layers is really the story of the origin of flowering plants, which seems to have taken place around 135 million years ago. Let's say a little bit about the Nitales. Uh, this is Baines, one of the first collectors of Wellwitcher in the Namibian desert. It's a self-portrait uh, of him with this remarkable plant, Wellwitcher. It's a little easier to get to these days, although my son seemed a little less impressed than I was with these rather strange plants uh, growing in the Namibian desert. At Kew, we have... Uh, some of the original specimens, and this is uh, the original specimen brought back by Baines, and we also have some of his field sketches that were turned into remarkable illustrations, again, by that great artist Fitch. And Wellwitcher is related to uh, these two genera, Ephedra and uh, Neetum. Neetum, a tropical climber, Ephedra, uh, a plant with a kind of switch habit of uh, dry places around the world. Now, this group, the Nitales, do have very distinctive uh, pollen grains with rugby ball-shaped pollen grains with these uh, striations. And these kinds of pollen grains do occur in the fossil record. And this is back from a locality in Virginia at around about um, 120 or a little younger million years. And back in 1987, Gary Upchurch and I described a little plant which we assigned to the Nitales. Um, you can see it's tiny, this is a millimetre uh, scale. We had lots of specimens. And from that same locality, but not from the same bed, um, Elsa Marie and Kai and I have recently, and uh, Katerina Ridin, have recently been able to describe seeds that clearly belong to the Nitales uh, too. And they are, uh, these seeds have two layers uh, around the outside. Here's the outer uh, layer with the inner layer and the seed itself uh, gone. And they have uh, characteristic ephedroid pollen grains in the micropyle. And these seeds occur not only in eastern North America, but as you can see from this name, they also occur uh, commonly in early Cretaceous floras uh, from Portugal. And they're very comparable to the seeds of uh, modern ephedra, 
and this is the hard outer layer out of which pokes the micropyle, uh, the entrance uh, to the seed it's, itself. And we've got lots of other records of this group now appearing. Back in 1987, there was almost nothing known of the fossil record of Neetales, and I don't have time to go into the details, but now we have a lot. And I particularly like this specimen from the uh, Albion of Brazil. So these are these deposits that are of similar age to some of the ones that we're looking at in Portugal, East and North America. Very similar to the cones of modern, female cones of modern Woolwichian. So I kid my colleagues who write uh, paleobotanical textbooks that in 1983 the Neetales, one of five living groups of seed plants, got a quarter of a page in a book of 396 pages. In the next edition in 1993 it got a page and a half. I hope when they do it next time that it'll get a chapter. We've got enough, uh, we now know enough about the fossil history of this group um, to deal with them in a bit more detail. But we have um, a number of seeds in these early Cretaceous uh, deposits that we're now able to study using this new uh, X-ray microtomography uh, technique. And they reveal their structure very nicely. And uh, the central point is that they have these two layers. Here's the micropile uh, itself, and then here's what we call the outer envelope. And this is a section through, and you can see the micropile protruding out, and then the uh, outer envelope. And this structure is uh, extremely consistent through a huge range of these seeds that we now have from the early Cretaceous. I'll just show you some of them. Here's another one that shows very beautifully uh, the extension of the integument through up through this region, forming the micropile up to the top with this thick outer envelope. And it, it seems that the uh, micropile itself becomes blocked by the growth of the cells uh, in this area. But you can see very clearly the two layers at the very top there, and you can see that the inner layer gets a little thicker by the time you get down uh, to this level. And as you go down still further, it becomes harder to separate those two layers. Well, I won't go through them in detail, but we have many, many seeds of this uh, kind. So on the one hand, these seeds compare very nicely with the fossil seeds of uh, ephedra, but they also compare very nicely with these seeds uh, of another group that have different kinds of pollen grains associated with them. Uh, pollen grains of the Eucomiodites type, uh, enigmatic gymnosperm uh, pollen grain um, that occurs in the micropiles of these uh, seeds. So we now have this group of fossil seeds that are similar on the one hand to the seeds of ephedra, similar on the other hand to the seeds of these eucomiodites producing plants, and they have various kinds of pollen grains in eucomiodites or even simple monocolpate pollen grains. And this little uh, beautiful photograph of Elsa Marie shows the, some of the diversity of these seeds. What's interesting, however, is how these seeds can be compared to the seeds of some of the other seed plants that are around. And in particular, in these lovely dinosaur reconstructions, you often see these plants that look a bit like Christmas puddings down on the, the floor of the forest here, and with flowers on the surface, and these cycad-like leaves coming up. And these are uh, a fossil plant called Cycadioidea, and they're some of the best-known fossil plants of the uh, Benetitales. So we went back to look at one of the very best-known of these uh, Benetitalian flowers, Cycadioidea uh, moriori, which is from, uh, from France, actually. And um, uh, it's really quite well uh, preserved. And here's a, a, a single seed, and it can be studied with that same uh, tomographic uh, technique. And to cut a long story short, it shows the same structure, the tubular, long tubular micropile and then this thick outer layer, even with the same kinds of cells that we see in some of these dispersed uh, seeds. So what's the significance of uh, all of this? I just slipped through a couple of slides and then I'll, uh, I'll come to the conclusion. Um, the significance is that that 
these new fossil seeds that we have, on the one hand, are similar to seeds of living ephedra. On the other hand, are similar to seeds of Benetitales and also compare to seeds of Eucomiodites type plants. And it's a very unusual seed structure. It has uh, this inner layer with a hard uh, outer layer. So the question really is, does this seed structure, which um, under the, analysis, the morphological analyses that have been uh, put forward here seems to unite this group, does this seed structure really extend to angiosperms? And is the second layer that we're picking up here in Benetitales, Nitales, and this group of fossil seeds, is that the same second layer that we see in the seeds of angiosperms? And that, I think, is the real question. So where do we go from, from here? Well, first of all, um, we need to reconcile this interpretation with the seeds of some other extinct uh, plants. This is Pentoxalon um, from the early Cretaceous uh, of India. Uh, and uh, I'll wager that it will end up being interpreted in the same uh, way. We also have some other interesting and intriguing fossil plants. This is Catonia. How does this double layer that we see from the Jurassic of Yorkshire, how does that compare with what we see uh, in Catonia and other seed ferns? So, and then, of course, if this hypothesis was true and if this second layer is, is uh, 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 a feature that unites these groups, then we ought to be able to reconcile how their pollen-producing structures fit together. And we know a little bit about that, um, but it's not something that we can readily solve at the moment, but it's something that can potentially be solved by looking uh, at more of this fossil material. So, finally, uh, then, I just say a few brief words about, about insects. Um, obviously, um, the diversification of flowering plants has been linked uh, in very large part to the diversification uh, of insects. About a third of the approximately 1.5 million species of insects known feed at some point in their lives on plants, and most of the plants today are angiosperms, and so uh, there's clearly a strong ecological association, not just on the pollination side, um, but also uh, uh, in terms of herbivory. There are various ways to look at it that I won't uh, go into, but I just want to make uh, one important point, I think. Some of these groups of pollinating insects have a fossil record that goes back way before uh, angiosperms, beetles and flies uh, in particular. We have evidence from living groups such as ephedra and cycads of uh, insect-mediated pollen transfer uh, in those groups. And as I've said, we have evidence of flower-like reproductive structures among uh, some of the seed plants uh, that predate angiosperms uh, in the fossil record. Um, living flowering plants, of course, show uh, a wide range of showy uh, adaptations that we've uh, spoken about over the last few days and wonderful work being done uh, on aquilegia reported uh, at this meeting that definitively show very close relationships between the evolution of these flowers and the evolution of, of insects. So back to uh, uh, the lotus and uh, I'll just finish. This is from Darwin's home. Uh, this was a, a platter that he was given by the Wedgwood uh, family. It shows the lotus there. It shows the water lilies uh, that we've been talking about. Um, I wonder if he contemplated this and as he was thinking about his uh, abominable uh, mystery. I don't think we've solved the aspect of where flowers come from, but I think we've solved some aspects of uh, the abominable mystery in terms of uh, timing. Uh, those of us in Chicago have great hope that we will be able to solve this problem in the fullness of time and that the fossil record will ultimately <laughs> reveal <laughs> the very gradual change that we can believe in. Thank you very much.
Peter, that's fabulous. Thanks very much indeed, Peter. We, we have time for a few questions. And if people would like to ask questions, if they could stand up so the camera can uh, spot you, and if you could give your name so that uh, we know who you are. So can I call for any questions? At the back there. Rupert Sheldrake, um, thank you for this wonderful lecture, very illuminating. Can I ask what may be an, an impossible question? Have you any idea whether the first flowering plants were herbaceous, trees, or shrubs? Is there any indication at all about what kinds of plants they were? We can say a little bit about that, and we can, uh, we can, do, we can make some guesses about it from two different directions. One way is to look at the modern relatives uh, of the plants that we know uh, were present in the early Cretaceous, and by and large, they're herbaceous to shrubby things. They're not large trees. So at this meeting, we reported uh, aroid monocots, obviously herbaceous, uh, chloranthaceae, woody plants, but not generally uh, uh, large plants, water lilies, herbaceous, of course. The other argument that we can make is... Um, it's very interesting that there's not much angiosperm wood in the fossil record from the Cretaceous, whereas there's lots of angiosperm wood in the fossil record from the Cenozoic. Obviously, angiosperm wood preserves extremely uh, well. That's not to say that there were no large angiosperm trees in the late Cretaceous, but they don't seem to have been diverse and they don't seem to have been very uh, common. We do have wood fragments that we can relate to uh, 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 the modern bay laurel family, um, Lauraceae, and we have other wood fragments that we can refer to the modern plane tree family that we see growing uh, outside. But in general, uh, there's very little evidence of large angiosperm trees uh, in, the late, in the late Cretaceous. A question just there. Um, there's a microphone just on its way. Uh, my name is David Plumstead, and I'm at the moment researching uh, various aspects of the development of, um, of uh, the honeybee and uh, relay, trying to relate it to its history and how it's developed and what might account for the current hiatus in the uh, worldwide colonies uh, of bees in trouble. Uh, and I just wondered if, uh, if you could kindly aim me at the sort of literature that I could look at, because obviously the bee preceded the plants uh, that we've been talking about today. And I just wanted to see how, how it came in and how they got together. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, on the, on the, if I've had more time to talk about the insect side, uh, I said that we have beetles and flies, probably pollinating kinds, before angiosperms. Um, Lepidoptera, um, with chewing mouth parts, appeared around the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary. And then a little later, um, true... Uh, Lepidoptera with, uh, with uh, sucking uh, mouth parts. And as we as regard to the bees, the earliest, I mean, bees obviously don't have a great fossil record, but they do have a fossil record in the Cenozoic. The earliest bee is from uh, New Jersey amber, and it's thought to be around about, uh, it's, it's thought to be in the top of the, uh, of the late Cretaceous, around about 70 million years. Uh, it's clear that, that bees and Lepidoptera, if you wanted to choose two groups that really probably have evolved in concert with flowering plants, those would be two very obvious insect groups that, that, that you would point to. So we don't, we don't have uh, any record of, uh, of bees prior to about 70 million years. I have a, a question there. Um, Paul Reimer, Imperial College. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I heard a talk by Graham Bell, who um, reviewed some of the work by Darwin. And one of the claims that he made was that Darwin actually led us astray by saying that evolution was slow and required a long <laughs> amount of time. And in fact, his argument, which he pushed forward very strongly, was that we have strong selection operating and quite rapid evolution, and he provided some case studies. Can you comment on that, please? Yes. I mean, I don't think that, I don't think the, uh, that what the fossil record will provide, and, and uh, this really last slide is a little bit of fun, but, uh, I mean, you don't see uh, gradual evolution in the fossil record in general. 
Um, what you see is things coming into the fossil record and staying relatively unchanged for long periods of time. I mean, I, I, would, I would certainly subscribe to, to the sort of punctuated equilibrium view as being close to what we see. It's harder in flowering plants to judge this because obviously if you're dealing with a trilobite or something, you've got a reasonably whole organism to look at. But with flowering plants where you've only got a pollen grain and a leaf and so on, you, you, you may miss changes that are occurring uh, in the other organ systems. But what I think we could expect to see in the fossil record and where my little bit of hope uh, comes in, because we see it in other areas, where we've got uh, a group of defining features like the two integuments, like the carpal, like the stamen. In other parts of the fossil record, we can see those features coming in sequentially. In other words, we find groups that have some, but not all of the defining features of the modern group. That's what one would hope to find here with angiosperms. So we might expect to find a group that has two coverings around the ovule, but that hasn't yet got a carpal and that hasn't yet uh, got a stamen. That's the experience that we would bring from looking at other aspects of the plant uh, fossil record. So we won't see gymnosperms changing imperceptibly and gradually into flowering plants, but I think what we could see is some of these intermediate transitional forms, and I think uh, we've probably already described them uh, without actually recognizing what they are. That would be my guess. Time for a final question, if anyone has one. Just in the front of the aisle there. <coughs> I just wondered if you, uh, it's Martin Sands, Robert Hunnick um whether the microtomography had shown up any of the vasculature, and if it has, uh, has it helped in any way to interpret the relationship between the floral parts? Uh, we do see uh, a vasculature both in, in the flowers and also uh, in the seeds. It doesn't really provide us with any additional evidence one way or another at this uh, at this point. But certainly the technique, and particularly um, uh, the high, very high resolution approach from uh, Villigan, from the Swiss light source, which has got better resolution than we've, uh, than we've been able to obtain in Japan, you can certainly see uh, the vasculature. If the vasculature is uh, there in these charcoalified fossils, you will definitely be able to see it. Thank you. I'm afraid we have to bring it to a close there. But let me just finally thank Peter again for a, a wonderful talk. I think one of the great things about the research that we've heard this evening is that it's research that is sort of based on techniques that go back 100, 150 years that Darwin would have been, a, would have been aware of, but then brought bang up to date with these wonderful new ways of visualizing microfossils, something Peter hasn't talked about, the complex statistical analysis that goes into building those phylogenetic trees, and then the link with the new molecular techniques. So it's a wonderful link between bang up to date, cutting edge biology, but then going all the way back to things that Darwin would, would have recognized. So Peter, thank you again for a really fascinating talk. Thank you very much.